it's just seems so long. It sure does. <laughs> I was just thinking the same thing. Hello, and thank you for joining TELUS Science Museum's live virtual preview and lecture for Out of This World During the Space Age. I'm Amy Gramsey, Director of Curatorial Services and co-curator of this exhibition. Um, before we start, I would like to give out a thank you to all the lenders who provided us with beautiful jewelry and objects for this exhibition, as well as a thank you to my TELUS exhibit team for all the hard work getting this exhibition ready, and our co-curator, Elise Zorn Carlin, for creating this ex exhibit and all the work she did working with the lenders. I'm excited to have Elise Zorn Carlin joining us tonight. Elise is a jewelry historian and co-director of the Association for Study of Jewelry and Related Arts. She's also the publisher of Adornment, the magazine of jewelry and related arts. Elise is the author of Jewelry and Metalwork in the Arts and Crafts Tradition and has various curating credits related to jewelry at institutions around the US, including earlier versions of Out of This World, Jewelry in the Space Age at the Forbes Gallery and the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. I'm eager to have here Elise share what inspired her to create this exhibit. I'm pleased to welcome Elise Zorn Carlin. Hello, Elise. Hi, Amy. I'd like to thank you and everyone else at the TELUS for bringing out of this world to the museum. The exhibition looks absolutely wonderful. I'm very sad that I'm not there to see it in person. So let's go ahead and get started with my PowerPoint lecture. Um, it's opening. Okay. When I came up with the concept for this exhibition out of this world, Jewelry in the Space Age, I spent a great deal of time researching and trying to understand how mankind has related to space as far back as ancient times. Most of my focus was on the 1950s, when the space race began in earnest. Today, I'll talk about how America's fascination with outer space has been and is visible across the breadth of our cultural landscape, influencing the design of household products, toys, and fashion, and of course, most important to me, personal adornment. From the earliest times, man has looked to the skies and observe the wonder of the stars, the moon, and the planets. With the invention of the telescope in the early 16th century, forward-thinking men dreamed of travel to space and wrote novels about it, like From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne in 1865, which amazingly foreshadowed what was to come. In the early 20th century, movies and TV shows were based on this imaginary travel before it was actually possible. From Buck Rogers to the um, Pluto X, oh wait, I'm sorry, I just lost a slide here. Okay, um, from Buck Rogers to um, going beyond Pluto, which is what New Horizons down here did, we've come a long way in our quest to go to outer space. I'm sorry, I keep skipping, there we go. Before 1950, the public's images of soaring above the earth was focused on rockets. The research done by Robert Goddard became known and people were familiar with the wartime use of rockets. Here we see Robert Goddard with the first liquid fuel rocket. This is in 1926. And we also see a very frightening looking World War II German V2 rocket. The public's imagination was also captured by purported sightings of flying saucers, a term first coined in 1930 and more than likely just a meteor. In 1947, the term became popular after a famous sighting of a saucer-like craft, which was probably a photographic hoax. In 1952, the government began calling these spacecraft UFOs or unidentified flying objects. And you may think this is kind of humorous at this point, 
but only in the last year or so we've heard about Navy pilots seeing unusual spacecraft they could not explain. And in the 1950s, this is the popular feeling about space. You can see these great uh, skirts, like purple skirts, and inside the balloons are aliens' heads. And this is how children viewed the idea of going to outer space in the 50s. The toy industry and other companies that marketed to kids profited from visions of space beginning in the 1940s. And this continued up until today with all the Star Wars merchandise that is being sold. But the biggest impact on American culture came when Sputnik, the first artificial satellite, was launched in 1957 by Russia and shook the world. Suddenly, Sputnik everything appeared in popular culture, albeit in a very stylized manner and almost unrecognizable from the actual satellite. And I only learned today that it was only about 18 inches in diameter. I had no idea it was that small. So here we see popular culture based on Sputnik. Space as it was imagined influenced the home environment in the 60s. The Sputnik lighting fixture is still being made today and it's quite expensive. And I'd love to own this bar set. The chair is known as a ball chair and we have a little Sputnik tin bank in the center. The movies in the early 20th century depicted space travel quite frequently. The first image you see here is actually a still from a 1902 film based on a Jules Verne novel. We also had characters like Flash Gordon in the 1930s who traveled through space. And of course, later there were many movies, including the campy Forbidden Planet, E.T., Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and the famously popular Star Wars. Oops, sorry. On TV, we had Space Patrol, which ran from 1950 to 55, and Third Rock from the Sun, among others. But perhaps fashion is the most significant area that space visions had an effect on as designers began imagining outfits to wear to go into space or to wear once you got there. The fashion industry went crazy after Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon in 1969. Designers like Pierre Cardin, Coco Rabanne, and Andrew Courrej created this outlandish but fascinating clothing and eyewear. I think I skipped. Yes, these vintage Sputnik influence brooches and earrings were what made me start thinking about doing an exhibition related to space. They're actually in my own collection, and I didn't really understand in the beginning when I owned them that they were reflecting an artistic approach to Sputnik's design. This set me off on an adventure learning about space exploration and jewelry. I'm sorry, it just clicks too fast. Okay, I soon discovered that space influence jewelry really dates back to Halley's Comet. In 1682, Sir Edmund Halley, the official British astronomer, saw a comet in the sky and determined it had previously appeared in 1531 and 1607. He predicted it would return in 1758 and that it would be visible approximately every 76 years. His prediction was correct and it did return 1758 after his death and so it was named after him. When it reappeared again in 1835, a craze was born for jewelry depicting the comet. This craze continued for subsequent reappearances. The exhibition therefore starts with a chronology of jewelry with space from the beginning of this comet craze. The brooch we see on the left is from the Georgian period when the comet appeared in 1835 and is crafted of silver and diamonds. There are also 
base metal versions from the same time period. They were not all made of precious material. And on the right, we see a collection of costume jewelry brooches uh, collected by one of the lenders to the exhibition because her daughter is named Hallie. This is a picture of Queen Alexandra, who was queen around 1901 to 1910. Interest in the heavens continued to this period from the late 19th century to the early 20th century in the form of starburst jewelry made of diamonds and platinum. And she was, excuse me, she was famous for wearing a lot of them at one time. Um, at the brooch on the left, the pendant on the left at the top is a beautiful starburst um, pendant from the archives of Tiffany and Company. And below it, we see what we'd consider a costume jewelry version, although it wasn't called that at that time period, made of um, paste and some sort of base metal. We also included in the exhibition jewelry that children would have worn. At the top, <coughs> you see suspender parts that have um, embossed planets on them. Below, you see plastic, um, a pin and four rings that would have been found in jewelry, in um, cereal boxes. And at the top, there were pins uh, mostly made in Japan where children could pretend to be astronauts or pilots by wearing them. But there was also fine jewelry that followed the space interest. This beautiful um, 1950s rocket brooch uh, is diamond and platinum. We don't know who made it, um, but I've seen a similar um, rocket ship brooch made by Cartier. Then there was the commercially made jewelry, which is made in large quantities. Remember getting a toaster from your bank to open a savings account? Maybe you're not old enough, but I remember. This rocket mechanical bank was created by Astro Manufacturing Company. The basic rocket shape contained a spring-loaded mechanism that could shoot a coin into a slot on the underside of the rocket's nose. It was created to be distributed as a premium by local commercial banks. Included with it was an adhesive sticker that advertised the gifting institution. The cuff set above it was given as a gift to the bankers who purchased the banks for their customers. And on the my left side, I think it's the right, um, this Sputnik pendant, is, it's small and not terribly significant, but to find a piece of jewelry in an original box that actually said Sputnik on it, and it does also say genuine cultured pearl, was quite a find. Charm bracelets were also extremely popular in the 50s and 60s and also re, uh, reflected space. You could either buy a finished bracelet with all the charms together. You could buy separate charms and create your own bracelet. And this bracelet at the bottom is quite interesting. Um, it features images of Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space from Russia, John Glenn, our first man who orbited the the uh, Earth and Laika. Laika was the first dog to orbit the Earth in Sputnik 2 in 1957. Unfortunately, they had no return plan for her and she died in space. Another aspect of space related jewelry is that when a mission um, is underway, NASA or their contractors will make piece jewelry pins. Here we have a, a pair of earrings that are given to the people that work on the missions. The long satellite earrings at the bottom are actually contemporary, and the artist who lent them to us was commissioned to make them from someone who I think may have been related to the space business, but I'm not certain of that. When the moon landing took place, the Apollo 11 mission on July 20th, 1969, a lot of jewelry was made to commemorate that day. In the fine jewelry category, we have this one-of-a-kind, beautiful pendant, uh, the gold work that is texturized to look like the moon surface is wonderful, and the ruby indicates where they landed. This was made by Van Cleef and Arpel, and it's rather large. If you come to see the exhibition, you'll see that. On the other side of the screen, we see a piece of costume jewelry made by Accessicraft, 
Um, what's interesting about it is that I've never seen a second one, but I did discover that Accessocraft made this eagle brooch for a long time. So I think they just added a plaque to the eagle brooch to commemorate the moon landing. This is jewelry by Napier Company in the 60s. Um, I showed you the pretty wild looking clothing before. Well, this is the kind of jewelry that would be worn on the runway with that clothing. The bracelets are known as the flying saucer bracelets and they're very rare to find. And then we have this fabulous huge necklace. In the 1980s, for some reason, Scandinavian jewelers got interested in space influenced jewelry. They executed in an oversized and very bold way. On the left, we see the full moon necklace by Tapio Workala, and he did a half moon version as well. And it's kinetic. If you hold it straight up, the circles start uh, turning and, and twisting. And on the right, we see a bracelet that looks very similar to work done by Bjorn Wegstrom, who we'll talk more about later. Uh, but it's by an artist that we're not familiar with, but it's de definitely in the 80s style. The next section of the exhibition, we focused on jewelry made from materials that came from space, materials that artists are using today. Here we see a picture of Henri Moussin, a French scientist who was trying to create synthetic diamonds. He was known for creating the electric arc furnace, which used very high heat and pressure to try to create a synthetic diamond. He claimed to have done that in 1893, but it's doubtful if he actually did. However, the same year he began studying fragments of a meteorite that was found in Arizona, and he discovered minute quantities of a new mineral and concluded that it was made of silicon carbide and was not a diamond as he originally thought, but it looked just like a diamond. In 1905, this mineral was named moissanite in his honor. Moissanite in its natural form is very rare. It's been discovered only in a small number of places in the Earth's upper mantle rock and in meteorites. Moissanites look very much like a diamond, which caused a firm known as Charles and Colvard to develop synthetic moissanite a number of years ago. They call it created moissanite. It was first used for industrial purposes because of its hardness, optical properties, and thermal conductivity. More recently, it's been used for jewelry as a very good imitation of diamonds at about half the price. It was originally only crafted as colorless uh, synthetic diamond, but it's now made in colors. And you see we have a green stone here. And I think that's probably because the value of colored diamonds has been growing. Meteorite is another material from space that jewelers seem to really enjoy working with. A meteorite is a piece of debris which originated from a meteor or asteroid and survived after impact with the Earth's surface. It doesn't become known as a meteorite, it's just a meteor until it hits the ground. And it seems to be particularly popular in men's jewelry, but not only men's jewelry. Gibeon meteorite, which is what most jewelers use, is a specific type of iron meteorite, one of the three types of meteorites. Gibeon fell in prehistoric times in what is now the town of Gibeon in Namibia, Africa. And the indigenous Nama people used it to make tools because it's so hard. You can see the designs in, the, uh, in some of the meteorite. Those are called Widmanstadt patterns. And they're inherent in the material. They're not something that artist etched in. But they can be revealed through cleaning and polishing and sometimes with an application of nitric oxide. Tektites are small pieces of natural glass that scientists believe are formed. At the top, you're looking at a piece of tektite material and a necklace made with tektite. They believe it's formed when extraterrestrial matter hits Earth, forming a crater and forcing debris out of the crater. The enormous heat turns the molten material to glass. They're found in a number of colors, black, green, brown, and gray. At the bottom of the screen, we see moldavite, which is a specific type of tektite. 
found in a town in the Czech Republic. It's olive green or dull greenish. The limited gem quantity of gem grade moldavite is expected to be mined out in a few years. Palisite is actually gemstone quality peridot found in tiny pieces in iron nickel meteorites. They are believed to be impact generated mixtures of both core and mantle materials. And now we move on to materials that are used in space exploration that are also used in jewelry. Titanium is a lustrous metal with a silver color, low density, and high strength. It's resistant to corrosion and lightweight, so it's perfect for both spacecraft and for jewelry. <coughs> it's also good for people with allergies to certain metals to wear because it's inert. Titanium may be anodized to vary the thickness of the surface oxide layer, causing optical interference fringes, which put simply means it'll turn into a variety of bright colors. Fiber optics were used by NASA in the television cameras that were sent to the moon. This is what you're seeing on the left side of the screen. Optical fibers are created by stretching a molten bundle of special glass rods until <coughs> they are thinner than a human hair. Then many of these bundles are fused together to make fiber optic material for such uses as telecommunications and computer networking. If you have Verizon Fios in your house, you're using fiber optics. Fiber optic beads are cut from fiber optic glass to reflect light in the way a cat's eye gemstone appears. The higher the grade of fiber, the more pronounced the eye will be. And it comes in many, many colors. Dichroic glass was developed by NASA for use in optical filters. The technique actually dates back to at least the fourth century AD. It's created by sandwiching ultra thin layers of different metals such as gold or silver and oxides of metals like titanium, aluminum, or chromium, which are then vapor coated with an electronic beam into a vacuum chamber. The vapor, the vapor condenses on the surface of the glass in the form of a crystal structure. Vivid colors result and can appear to change you when viewed from different angles. So it, sort of reflects different things as you turn it. Nitinol is a very interesting material. It's actually nickel titanium and has two related and unique properties. And we see this wonderful bracelet here by Sergei Javetin. It has shape memory and super elasticity, which means that it can undergo deformation at one temperature and then recover its original shape when it's heated. It also has 10 to 30 times the elasticity of ordinary metal. Two engineers at the Naval Ordnance Laboratory discovered it in 1959. They were attempting to make a better missile nose cone, which could resist fatigue, heat, and the force of impact. In 1961, they presented a sample at a laboratory management meeting. They had folded the sample up like an accordion, and then they passed it around and flexed it uh, by the participants. One of the people that handled it decided to apply heat from his pipe lighter to the sample. And to everyone's surprise, the accordion-shaped strip stretched and reverted to its previous shape before it was folded. Although it has been sometimes used in spacecraft, it's been used more for commercial purposes, including med medical equipment such as retractable tweezers developed by NASA and is even used in the underwire of rods. Polymer, which is a kind of plastic, is used for all kinds of applications in spacecraft, for insulation, for circuit boards, and other things I'm not familiar with, but I know there are more. So here we have um, a necklace made of polymer, uh, which is a by the uh, well-known polymer artist Elise Winters. It's known as a ruffle necklace and an open hexagon brooch by Rachel Karen. Polymer comes in kind of a clay form and it's become very popular with artists and it's been elevated to an art form. 
Flown in space is another category. You may know that astronauts are allowed to take up to 20 personal effects on a mission in their personal preference kit, but they are limited to only 1.5 kilograms in weight. So jewelry is often the choice because it's small and it can be given to loved ones when you return from space. Here we see astronaut Katie Coleman, who's been on several missions to the International Space Station, and she was graciously uh, willing to lend us jewelry that she took into space. Also in the exhibition, which you'll see when we do the tour, is um, a planet globe created by her husband, and who's a very well-known glass artist, Josh Simpson, and she also flew that in space. These are some additional pieces that have been flown in space. At the top, we have lamp blown um, beads by various artists that were commissioned by Beads of Courage, which is an organization that uh, works with very sick children. And children get beads, not these, these are part of their traveling exhibition, but they get beads every time they reach um, a part of their treatment that they've overcome. At the bottom, we have a watch uh, known as the Mars watch. This wasn't actually flown in space, but because it's connected to missions, uh, we showed it here. <clears throat> the watch was created by Garrow Ancelarian, who's a master watchsmith in California. Jet Propulsion Laboratory came to him and said, we have a problem. We have all these um, projects going on with Mars. Mars has 37 minutes more per day than the Earth does. Um, it's, the day is called the Sol. SOL. So they challenged him to make a watch that would tell time in Mars time, and he did it. And he also made a separate watch that tells time in Mars and the United States at the same time. And here we see a ring made by Master Goldsmith Tom Herman, um, which the jade for the ring was flown in space. <clears throat> Mission pins and memorabilia are something that both NASA and NASA contractors create when they're working on a project. At the top, we see um, two mission pins from the Applied Physics Laboratory of Johns Hopkins University, um, Messenger and Near. <clears throat> and at the bottom, we see Russian space pins, and the gentleman who engraved them was kind enough to lend them to us. This is a popular uh, part of the exhibition. It's the Star Wars and Star Trek area. This is a picture of Carrie Fisher in the original Star Wars movie. I've lost track of how they named them anymore because they've gone backwards. But she's wearing a necklace by Bjorn Wegstrom, which is known as the Planetoid Valley Necklace. When um, George Lucas was creating this movie, he went to Bjorn Wegstrom and said, can you design a necklace for the final scene of the movie? But they gave him such a short time frame, he couldn't meet it. So instead, they actually went out and purchased this necklace. And ever since Carrie Fisher wore it, everybody calls it Princess Leia's necklace. It's become quite famous. Um, on the other side of the screen, we see a contemporary version of Princess of the Star Wars necklace by Brenda Smith, who actually lives in Georgia. She, and at the top, um, we have a ring um, by Paul Michael Berker, which is based on Star Trek. It's called the Boldly D ring. The last part of the exhibition uh, consists of contemporary jewels. When I first conceived of this exhibition, the earlier sections came pretty clear to me. But I thought, I'm going to have a really hard time finding contemporary jewelry with space themes. And to my shock, there was so much I didn't even know how to choose. Mm -hmm. So at the top, we have um, the space station brooch. And at the bottom, we have Take Me to Your Leader ring. And this pendant is the comet and space debris um, pendant. In this slide, we have the... Um, Big Bang Theory pendant, and below that we have just a wild, large rock, uh, which I guess is um, to show the debris out in space pendant. And then we have the solar system necktie. 
And here we have one of Claudio Pino's rings. Uh, Claudio has become very, very well known for his kinetic rings. All those rings in the center turn and twist. And um, he's very well known uh, artist who has had his rings um, shown in the Hunger Games, worn in the Hunger Games. Below that, we have the um, simple landscape cuff, uh, which I just love. It's mixed metal and it's so simple and yet you know exactly what you're looking at. Um, the other bracelet is called the circular reasoning bracelet. And I love the little spaceship going around. And the bottom um, are the Venus earrings from Stephen Kretschmer. Um, he created a new metal that's magnetized. And so it looks like that's all soldered together. It's not. If you pull the discs apart, they snap back together because of magnetism. And our final slide, oops, we went too far. Hold on, there we go. Um, the final slide, um, at the top of the slide, we have the universe pendant, uh, which is done in beautiful enamel work. <coughs> Next to that, we have the cosmos brooch. We have planet hoop earrings. We have black diamond star ear clips. They're quite large. Earth pendant, which is a blown glass pendant. And finally, the pinwheel necklace. <clears throat> Thank you, Elise, uh, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I think it kind of gave a great insight as to how you overall did this exhibit and how you created it. Um, now let's take a look at the vault gallery <coughs> where Out of This World is and see the exhibition and some of the cases. So here's our vault going into our special gallery space. Leading into one of the first cases on meteorites and materials from space. Over here we have a uh, case on the cometary uh, visions that highlight the comet craze of the Halley Comet. And then you kind of see the rest of the gallery going into some of the more uh, contemporary cases. And over here we have one of the cases talking about all the pop culture influences, which is great. You see the little uh, rocket bank right there. And this is the case that uh, Elise spoke about with the materials um, used from space exploration and polymers and titanium. And off to the left, we have a case that talks about um, all the three different categories of jewelry, some of the fine jewelry, custom jewelry, and studio jewelry. Within the back, you see some um, Tiffany pieces. And this is the flown in space case that has the beads of courage right there and some of the items from Katie Coleman. And our next case is the uh, case about at the movies and on TV. This was the Star Wars and Star Trek influence. And a few more contemporary cases. Now, this is an interesting piece. Elise, can you tell me a little more about this item? I sure can. Uh, this is called the Astronaut Inro. It was created by Dan Cormier, who's a very well-known polymer artist and teacher. Uh, he actually used his 
own photograph uh, for the astronaut's face. And you see this cord on the back. That's why it's called an astronaut in row. An in row is actually an ornamental container with compartments for seals and medicine that would worn suspended from a waist sash as part of traditional Japanese men's dress. And uh, this actually does rotate if you have a battery inside of it. So it's as if he's moving in space. Great. Um, let's take a look at some uh, other cases that we have and talk about some of the other items. Um, so this is one of our cases called Art in Motion. It has some of the contemporary designers that explore motion. Um, so you have quite a few items in here. You have the Pinot um, kinetic rings in the back that you spoke of earlier. And then there's this piece in the back left corner, the lunar necklace. Um, can you talk about that one? Sure. First of all, I would love to wear this necklace. It's a great statement piece. The size is just wonderful. Um, you can actually feel the movement in the necklace, just like the cosmos moving around. Um, this necklace is by Sue Zabo, and her day job is as a doctor, but I think she's a great jewelry artist and she's made a number of space related pieces. Great. And there's also in this case some um, time traveler cuff bracelets that are really beautiful here too. Yes, I've had my eye on Jason's bracelets for a long time. They're by Jason McLeod, who's been making jewelry with space related themes for quite a number of years. He's been on all three exhibitions and these bracelets are from his time traveler collection. Great. Well, let's look at another case called um, past and present. So this case kind of talks about some of the mixed techniques and materials old and new. And in the, kind of not quite see it right now, but off in the corner there is the uh, star ruby earrings and this has a story to it, correct? Yes, uh, these are by Nikki Kavakonis, uh, who was a great romantic. Uh, unfortunately, we lost Nikki last year, which was very premature. But she was a wonderful jeweler and very um, inventive. And she based these earrings on a poem by 13th century Persian poet. Um, and the very last line of the poem is completely become and wear this sun ruby as an earring. And so it has a star ruby in it, and I'm glad that we can see it up close to see the star. Yeah, that's a great picture right there. So the uh, other case I'd like to highlight is the materials in space, you know, the ones that have the meteorites and tectites and moldavites in jewelry. So in this particular case, there's a meteorite collar. Um, can you talk about that item? Yes, that's by Barbara Natoli Witt. Um, Barbara, uh, has basically developed her own technique, which is kind of a tapestry technique with a mixture of macrame and lace making techniques, um, which is unique. I don't think anybody else makes anything like this. She incorporates gemstones and beads and often ancient and historic artifacts into her one of a kind pieces. She never makes a piece twice. This particular one has a large piece of meteorite in it on the side. And then there are also meteorite beads incorporated into it. It's very unique, yeah. Uh, let's go to our dawn of space age. So there's a lot of items in this particular case that reflects upon the space race and how much of an impact it had on jewelry, including um, the cosmonaut Yuri Gargarian. I love that piece. Okay, are we looking at him? Uh, no, right there, there he is. There he is. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is by Ricky Boscarino, and um, I met him a number of years at a craft show, and he had tons of jewelry, which he makes all of it um, on kind of boards because it was outdoors in his booth. And I said, is that an astronaut? He said, astronaut? He said, that's Yuri Gagarin. He loves Yuri Gagarin, who was the first cosmonaut to go into space. <clears throat> so he's been very good about lending to us. And he lives in a house in New Jersey. <coughs> Excuse me. 
that he's completely covered with mosaics. It's known as Luna Park. And thousands of people go to visit it every year when he has an open house. He's very, very creative. Yeah, this is a very unique piece. I had fun trying to get this uh, mounted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty big. For it is. It's quite big. It's like uh, seven inches long or something like that. <laughs> when he sent me the brooch, he um, he sent me an email to say, Yuri's flying your way. So when I got it, I wrote back and I said, Yuri has landed. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And let's look at one more case. Uh, let's go to the science and art case. So this one kind of talks about how the cosmos has inspired jewelry to push their designs and kind of fabrications. Um, you know, in this case, we also have the Mars watch that you were talking about earlier. And there's also this brooch over here. Uh, uh, can you tell me a little more about it and the artist? Yeah, this is by Ezra Satak Woolman. Uh, it's known as the Perpetual Motion of the Universe brooch, and it's made of palladium, gold, and colored diamonds. Um, I think it's just beautiful. And you feel the movement of the universe with all the tiny little stars and wh whatever else is going on there. It could be space debris as well. Um, Ezra is a Canadian jeweler and master goldsmith. And I guess it's a couple years now ago that he had a solo exhibition entitled Jewelry for Astronauts and Space Travelers that was shown at a gallery in Barcelona, Spain. And I really love the simplicity and the elegance of his work. Um, it sparkles and makes you feel like space. <laughs> well, thank you, Elise. Thanks for sharing some of the uh, more detailed information about some of these uh, pieces. Oh, my pleasure. I wish I could talk about all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let me just check and see if we have any questions from our viewers or any comments on Facebook. Um, let's see, I have one. Someone wanted to know if you could uh, repeat your inspiration for the uh, exhibit. Well, it was really those um, brooches that looked like Sputniks. They were costume jewelry brooches. Um, I, I owned them for a while, and for some reason, the, the shape appealed to me, and I kept buying them. And then one day I looked at them, I said, oh my God, that's Sputnik. And that was where I started from. And then I thought, well, what else can I learn about jewelry and space? And it branched into a lot of different places. I mean, it's quite amazing all of the material that you've been able to gather together. I mean, it's, it's, I didn't realize how much was out there, but you know, you can see the, the inspiration and the pop culture leading into the 60s and 70s and the space race and then just even with the new exploration of space leading some of the um, newer contemporary people into newer designs it's, it's a really interesting concept and i don't think it'll stop i think the contemporary jewelers will go on and on well there's so much unknown still so <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, I don't really have any other questions. Um, is there uh, any other item that you would like to talk about at all or, um, you know? Well, I don't know if you can zoom in on anything. Um, it, it just, everything was so diverse as I started to research this. Um, it's now like four years ago, I guess, five years ago, um, that I was constantly surprised by something new. And so it was a joy to work on because there was always something new to see. And I'm sure I think each exhibition we've added a few new pieces. And um, so it keeps it fresh for me to always be searching for something new. OK, well, that's great. I do have a couple of questions that have popped up. Um, one of them is from actually one of our uh, own uh, employees here, Kenty Smith, who actually has a piece on exhibit here, um, one of the meteorite pendants. Um, she wanted to know, as a curator making this remarkable exhibit, which was the most challenging to acquire? To find the pieces, to borrow? Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess it neither was hard, but Tiffany and Van Cleef were the scariest part to ask for, but they were all of them, people at Tiffany and people at Van Cleef, were just so lovely and made it so easy um, that I think that was what I was in most trepidation about, but it turned out to be for no good reason, was fine. 
Yeah. Um, and I can actually talk more about that because yes, I was working <laughs> with them, particularly on their contracts. And with COVID, you know, there's a lot of concerns about how to get things here and, you know, um, things across from Europe too. But uh, everything worked out well. And, you know, we're glad to have everything here and, and have these items in this. Exhibit. Yeah, actually, uh, Stefano Pendanesi, who's in Italy, that was hard because he would send his jewelry to New York with a friend and then I would go to New York and get it. But she went back to Italy because of the pandemic, leaving the jewelry with somebody I did not know. And that lady was lovely. I finally went up to get it and realized one piece was missing and he had to quickly ship it from Italy. So that was a little complicated. Um, also, what's the oldest piece from the collection? The comet brooch, the the antique comet brooch would be the, the oldest, one? 1835. Okay. okay. Um, so someone's wondering um, what piece you're wearing and is there any story to it? Yeah, can you actually see it? I don't know if you can. You can see oh. a little bit of it. I'm going to take it off and see if I can hold it up. It does have a story, actually. Uh, if you can, I'll hold it near my camera. Is it there up just go. a little? There you go, yeah. Um, this piece is actually a piece of Druzy with titanium on it to give it this glow. And it started out, there were a couple of little titanium beads that my husband gave me as a gift. And then I had my friend uh, Mindy Ackerman, who's got two pieces that she made in the exhibition, the uh, necklaces. Uh, well, she put together two of the necklaces. And so she turned this into a necklace for me and it, it's tradition that I wear it for opening night. Of, out of this world. <laughs> Let it's me heavy. Just see. Yeah, it looks very heavy. Yeah. Let's see if there's a few other ones. So Michael here has a question. Was there any lighthearted jewelry based on the space aliens take me to your leader piece? Are you, are you talking about the ring? Yeah, I believe so. Okay, that, that's by Janice Kerman, uh, who lives in Canada. Um, I met Janice at a, a sh an antique craft show, and I took one look at that ring. It didn't have a name. I named it Take Me to Your Leader. Okay. And uh, so she seemed fine with that, so that's what we call it. But as soon as I looked at it, I just saw two little antennas sticking up. Yeah, they're kind of uneven, so I could see that a little bit. Yeah, I, I love that ring. Uh, we have uh, Katie Coleman, uh, shouts out, says, thank you, Elise, for putting the exhibit together. Everything looks fascinating. Her and Josh love seeing their pieces and contacts. Well, I love both of them because they've been wonderful. I'll tell you a little quick story about them. Um, I have yet to meet Katie because she was not home when I went to visit. Um, and I looked at some of Josh's glass and he took out her jewelry. And there was this big hunk of metal sitting on the dining table. and. He graciously invited us for lunch. A friend went with me. And I said, does this metal have anything to do with the space shuttle? And he said, oh, yeah, that's what holds it down. And it breaks away when the shuttle takes off. So that was so exciting to me. I can't even tell you <laughs> to be that close. Yeah, his uh, uh, blown glass is beautiful. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, if you ever get to go visit him in his studio, it's very worthwhile. Well, I hope I get a chance someday. Well, I think we've kind of reached the end of our program. Um, thank you, Elise, for joining us. Oh, my and, pleasure. And thank you for all the lenders and collectors who made this exhibit possible. Um, Out of this world, Jewelry in the Space Age opens tomorrow to the public, November 7th, and is free with regular mission to TELUS Science Museum. Uh, if you would like to come and see it, please reserve your tickets. Um, we have time tickets um, online that you can purchase at TELUSmuseum.org. Um, we look forward to seeing you. This exhibit's here until October of next year, so we've got quite a long time for a run. I hope everybody gets a chance to come and see it. And uh, thank you again. And uh, have a good night.